All right, so probably all of you know this already, but I am Talia. I am the content and community manager here at Hugo Health Kindred. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know, Kindred is building a network of data-enabled people who have been impacted by COVID and who want to contribute to research in partnership with leading scientists. I strongly encourage anyone who is not a member yet to join us. You can go to kindred.hugo.health for more information. And it is from Kindred that you can enroll in the Yale Listen study led by Drs. Iwasaki and Krumpholz. Today, we are pleased and honored to have Dr. Wes Ely here with us today. Um, this is super, super special guest where we've been kind of, you know, anticipating this event for a few months. So I'm just so happy that it's here. Um, and we have Nicole and Frank who will be moderating the event tonight. Nicole is living with vaccine injury and Frank is living with, with long COVID. Uh, so really without much further ado, I'd like to pass it off to the moderators. Um, so I think they're going to share their stories first. So Nicole, if you'd like to start. Yes, hi, welcome everybody and welcome Dr. Ely um, for joining us. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Nicole. Some of you might remember me from prior webinars and um, I am a patient advocate who is vaccine injured in April, 2021 by the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine. And uh, prior to getting vaccinated, I was um, very healthy, very active, I'm a former marathon and half marathon runner. I've been a vegan since I'm 15, was rarely sick, went to the PCP once a year and really had no medical problems aside from mild asthma and seasonal allergies in the spring. And that, that, that was pretty much it and rarely got sick. Um, I um, trained as a licensed clinical social worker and was working in behavioral health field for a very, um, in a very fast paced job for a insurance company. And um, once I got injured, I've been unable to work. I've been on disability for the last two years. I got my vaccine because I wanted to protect my family. My parents are in their eighties and wanted to protect myself and do what was right for the community. And I had no initial symptoms when I got the vaccine, not even a sore arm, no low grade fever, no headache, all the things they warn you about didn't, didn't happen to me, all that anxiety for nothing. And six days later, I began experiencing a burning sensation bilaterally in both of my arms. And that progressed to my back, my torso. I um, became very ill. I lost 17 pounds in less than a month, developed a lot of chemical and food sensitivities. Everything I eat made me really sick. And I developed tremors, um, weakness, um, muscle jerking, especially when I was going to sleep and um, visual disturbances and floaters, flashes of light and extreme, extreme fatigue. And the biggest, um, the biggest effect I had was the cognitive problems and really had short-term memory difficulties. Couldn't remember the name of some of my relatives, mixed up my niece's names, couldn't remember the name of my sister-in-law. And it, it, it's been a, a journey since then. Um, my, I've seen over 20 doctors, including seven neurologists and a lot of integrative doctors. There hasn't been much help. I have diagnoses of a possible small fiber neuropathy and I had a negative biopsy, so they can't prove that um, potential mast cell activation disorder, which explains a lot of the sensitivities and what else is there? Um, polyneuropathy, that, that's an easy one. And um, post-orthostatic tachycardia, otherwise known as POTS and reactivated Epstein-Barr and um, possibly reactivated Lyme disease which is a tick-borne infection and probably some more <laughs> things that I'm not, not remembering a lot of abnormal labs. And um, I am just really self-treating with a lot of supplements, um, low-dose naltrexone and um, try to get a lot of um, fresh air, do, do yoga, a lot of meditation just to really help cope with these symptoms and um, really committed to advocating for the vaccine injured and long COVID community. And thank you so much. And I'll hand it over to Frank. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, I'm Frank Ziegler. And I tested positive for COVID in January of 2021 and thought it was a sinus infection. And I just 
stuffed up head, drainage, sinus pressure, no cough, no fever. I uh, took an antibiotic and after about 10 days, uh, felt better. I lost smell, never lost taste. About two months later, I started noticing changes, started with fatigue um, that I had not experienced before, shortness of breath, uh, developed hand tremors and some internal vibrations and cognitive issues specifically with processing speeds and um, executive functioning. And that has been 28 months and all of those are still the same. Um, that's my introduction. Now I have the privilege of introducing our special guest, Dr. Wes Ely. Wes is the uh, Grant W. Little Chair in, medical, in Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. He's a pra practicing uh, physician um, and is co-director of the Critical Illness Brain Dysfunction and Survivorship Center. He also works with Dr. Jackson, who was a prior guest um, on Kindred. And um, Wes, and Wes has asked me to call him Wes, so it's not being disrespectful. Wes, if you just give us a little bit of your background and, and how you got to where you are today. I was going to say, sure, Frank, I will, but I don't really know where I am today. So, <laughs> but uh, Nicole, first, let me just say that listening to the truth of your story and what happened to you after the vaccine makes me really sad. And uh, I'm so sorry that you've gone through all of this. I don't understand what you went through, Nicole, and what you are continuing to go through. But I can say that it, my heart is just on the table here uh, about what you're suffering. And to me, your bravery in telling this story and helping people understand um, the vagaries, the, the, the difficulties of this illness are so important. And when you put your story up next to Frank's, and Frank, you and I um, know one another, and I know about your long COVID story. I, I also am so sorry for what you've gone through. I spent t two hours today on 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 calls with different long COVID patients, um, virtual uh, engagement situations, um, because we have lots of long COVID support groups at the Sib Center at, here at Vanderbilt and the VA. And um, my, my heart's just been tossed around all day long by by the amount of suffering that everybody's going through with this problem. And it's a real privilege for me to be with you all as a physician. I was a COVID doctor in the ICU. I'm an ICU physician. I'm a trained pulmonary and critical care doctor. And it is my uh, joy and privilege to take care of people who are in the throes of serious illness, who find themselves in, in the most vulnerable situation of their lives. And before I had gray hair, I, I ran long-term outpatient clinics for ICU survivors. And lately I've just been uh, before COVID was only doctoring people at the bedside in the ICU with uh, on life support. You asked me to tell a little bit of my story. I want to tell you that as a medical student and as a young physician, I was taught that these chronic post-viral illnesses were not very real. They were not a big deal, that they were not treatable and were and many of these patients were were more psychiatric than um, than organic in terms of disease. And I have gone through in the past two to three years because of you all teaching me a metamorphosis in my own thinking. And I am now devoting myself and many other people are devoting themselves to saying this is real. Medical society, the insiders of medicine, like I'm an insider in academic medicine. Let's quit it. Let's quit denying this illness. Let's quit denying these patients their just desserts, which is for us to sit with them and accompany you, um, Nicole and Frank, to accompany you and to admit what we don't know. And I want you to hear me say at the outset of this that I don't know and I am ignorant of the exact science of what you're suffering. Um, I have hypotheses that I'm going to test and study through NIH and, and VA funding. Just put in a 470-page grant to the NIA National Institute of Aging last week with other investigators from the University of California, San Francisco, and Emory, and Minnesota. And we, we know how frustrating this must be to not have answers to long COVID. And, and I promise you that we are trying to move science faster than it typically moves. It's not enough. It never will be. 
And all I can sit here and say is, I'm not going anywhere. We're going to sit with you. We're going to accompany you. We're going to admit we don't know it and just say, we're we're in this for the long haul with you. Um, that, those are my introductory thoughts. I just want to start with that and um, and tell you that I have had a conversion of thought, conversion of belief from from denying and 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 then being taught that long Lyme, MECFS, fibromyalgia, um, all these diseases are are less than real, and they are no less real than all the other diseases I care for in the ICU, like congestive heart failure and pneumonia and sepsis. Um, they're all just as real. And whether it's signs or symptoms you're suffering from, I believe what you're saying, and I'm sorry you're suffering. And we certainly appreciate that. Um, there are a number of people on this call that have never heard that from a physician. Uh, so to be able to hear it from you uh, means a lot, and we certainly appreciate it. We were uh, forwarded some pre-questions to, to ask you, and then um, there'll also be, we'll go back to Talia after Nicole and I ask a few of those, and she's going to open it up to the floor uh, for people. So if you're interested in submitting a question to uh, Wes, then please feel free to do so. Uh, my being here is a privilege. I'm here for you, not the other way around, and I will make myself available. Feel free. Uh, I will put my email in the chat in a moment. And you, anybody, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to in, in, in engage with you after this is over with as well. Um, again, just just to be part of this community is a privilege. So go ahead, Frank. Thank you. And and just a couple of questions um, that I had that came in kind of on a consistent basis. How did you become involved uh, in the long in long COVID research and then turning that into advocacy? What what kind of got you started on this? Okay. Yeah, this is interesting. So I, uh, when I, this is going way back and I have something in here I'm going to read later to you later. But I wrote this book called Every Deep Drawn Breath and it's about patients. It's not a long COVID book. It's it's actually not even a medical book. It's a book about people in life, but all the proceeds from it are going to long COVID patients and survivors. Anyway, I had a patient when I was an intern before I had all this gray hair. Her name is Teresa Martin. And Teresa, I did my best to take good care of her, but I did a terrible job and I hurt her. And she ended up with eight chest tubes. And I thought, oh, she's surviving. She's fine. Well, I had her come back to my clinic a couple of months later. And then I saw her for a long time after that. And her whole life was ruined. This was when I was a young doctor back in the 90s. And it was, I carried around so much shame and guilt about what I had done to Teresa in the name of good medicine and doing what my teachers were telling me to do with her on the life support and everything that I spent, I've spent the last 25 years trying to unpack what it was that happened to her and make medicine better. And so what that happened to her was called, is, is now called, 20 years later, we had a name for it in 2012, called post-intensive care syndrome. So I've been studying with the National Institute of Health and the VA and lots of other large randomized trials and, and cohort studies, post-intensive care syndrome for 25 years. And this is a disease, now follow this, where somebody comes in with one problem, and then they rapidly acquire an acquired uh, dementia and cognitive impairment, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and then muscle and nerve disease. Sounds kind of like long COVID, doesn't it? Um, except these are people who graduated from an ICU, survived an ICU experience. So we've been studying that for a long time. And when long COVID first came out, when COVID first came and we were taking care of them in the ICU, and people were complaining of the symptoms and signs that you two have, uh, Nicole and Frank, I actually thought that it was mostly just in the COVID survivors from the unit, the ICU, and I was thinking it's really just PICS, but I was wrong. And then I started seeing patients and having them come through our, our, our SIB center who had only had mild COVID and had never gotten sick or ever been hospitalized. And so I realized, oh, no, this is this is a this is a post-viral illness that is very real. And what happened in, in March of 2020 is a guy named Justin Stebbing published a paper using artificial intelligence to analyze four to 600 drugs for COVID. And the computer spit out that baricitinib was, the, the computer was predicting that baricitinib would be the best drug for acute COVID. So an, an HIV researcher named Vince Marconi and I worked with the maker of baricitinib, which is an immunomodulator. So think antivirals, 
immunomodulator and Paxlovid or remdesivir or antivirals that fight the virus specifically, explicitly. But then we know that the immune system of, of long COVID patients is dysregulated. And so maybe an immunomodulator would also work either in tandem or by itself to help save lives in acute COVID. And we designed this study called the Cove Barrier Study. It worked. Um, we did it in over 12 countries, 60 ICUs, 1,200, 1,500 people. And um, it's to date the largest survival advantage of any study, any drug in COVID. It's FDA approved. There are only two FDA approved drugs for COVID. One is remdesivir, the antiviral, and the other one is baricitinib, which I abbreviate and just call it berry, like a, like a, a like a raspberry, but it's B-A-R-I, citinib. And anyway, once we found that that drug worked for acute COVID and saved lives, it got approved by the World Health Organization and the FDA. And then those findings of our original COVID barrier study were reproduced five or six other times. There's now over 12,000 patients worth of randomized controlled trial data documenting that baricitinib saves lives in, in acute COVID. So that's how I started getting involved in acute acute COVID, but as the disease became clearer and clearer in long COVID, I started converting my mind to thinking, I've got, we've got an entire armamentarium of researchers, 120 researchers at Vanderbilt in our Sib Center who study PICS. Why shouldn't we devote ourselves to studying long COVID? So we started converting ourselves into a long COVID research institute. And that's what we do now is we study both side by side. And I call these rapidly acquired body diseases. One is rapidly acquired after intensive care and one is rapidly acquired after COVID. And so now we are using the same machinery that we've used for 15, 20 years to study po PICS, post-intensive care syndrome. And we're now using that same machinery to study long COVID. And, it, and that's, that's how we got started in this. And so let me stop there. Thank you. I mean, that's amazing. Um, You've worked with the with a lot of long COVID patients. Um, what is what is something or some things that surprise you or inspire you um, about the long COVID community? The, the the people that you've dealt with and you've seen you've seen them come from the from the um, ICU, and now you've seen groups like myself who were not even in the hospital, much less the ICU. So. What have you kind of picked up from, from the groups that you've dealt with? What I love, Frank and Nicole and Talia, everyone on this call, what I love is that the long COVID community is teaching me and the medical, the medical insiders, the medical community so much, and that you're and that you're not afraid to call us out on our mistaken thinking. Because we need what you could call it stinking thinking. Uh, we need to be corrected and our prejudices. You know, there's a lot of prejudice against calling a disease a disease if somebody doesn't have a positive test. Uh, we call this seronegative. So let's say there's a test for rheumatoid arthritis and somebody doesn't test positive for that rheumatoid arthritis test, but they have lots of joint aches. We would call that person seronegative. They're negative in their serum. Well, long COVID doesn't have a great test that's a publicly available. We, we are getting someplace with clotting and and immune tests, but there's not a publicly available test for long COVID. So essentially everybody's seronegative in the prejudice of the medical community. And what I love is that you're telling me, Wes, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. Listen to us and we'll tell you. And I also respect the fact that many people have told me, today I was on the phone with a, with a woman from Prague who got long COVID, who got COVID in New York, and now she lives in Prague. And she, told me, I'm just thankful that you're saying that you don't know. And I just am so glad to hear you say you don't know. You're a professor at a major medical center and you're admitting that you don't know. I don't have a problem with that at all. I'm glad you're calling us out. And we as a medical community need to do more. We have not done enough for you. And so I respect you. I want to listen to you and learn from you. I love that you're authoring papers with us. This grant I just submitted, the 470 page grant at NIH, We've got five long COVID patients who are helping us design and contributing to the science. So this is now a community effort of working together uh, to get this to get the answers. That's that's amazing. And again, we do certainly appreciate it, and it's a breath of fresh air. I'm going to 
turn it over to Nicole for a couple of questions that she's received. Okay. Um, okay. First question is that we're in a different place in 2023 in the pandemic than we were back in 2020 or 2021 or even 2022. What are the main changes you've seen providing critical care in regard to COVID and has Omicron made a difference in acute care and long COVID cases? Sure. You know, at the beginning, uh, I think we did a lot of things that were anti-medicine. So we're talking about in-hospital COVID care, correct? <clears throat> um, we, we were, you know, acting out of fear. Nelson Mandela has a great quote about fear. You know, let's act out of our hopes, not our fears. That's a paraphrase. Um, at the beginning, we didn't know how the virus, virus was transmitted. We didn't have enough PPE. We didn't have uh, vaccines, et cetera. And um, we didn't allow family in. We kept patients behind a glass. We threw out 20 years of research of how best to lift up a person during illness. Um, this was wrong. It was absolutely wrong to do this to human beings. It was uh, it was unjust, and it was it was um, unkind. But worse than that, it was even unscientific. So new COVID management, new COVID care includes. I'll tell you a story. I had a woman, and I've got permission to use these stories. Every every patient's story and every deep drawn breath is. I've got permission to tell their stories. I've got one I want to read to you in just a minute. Um, this woman had her fourth baby. She came in to the ICU with COVID. Her baby was in the neonatal intensive care unit, and she was on a ventilator on propofol and fentanyl. Now, the previous work that I did in the ICU would say that every day, every patient needs to have their drugs turned off so they can be woken up, see how they're doing, see how they're breathing, let family be in there with them. We have this bundle called the ABCDEF bundle. And essentially, it says it is inhumane to keep people um, sedated into the stone age, immobilized without family. What is humane, what is, I say we need, we need to pro promote humanism, is waking people up, letting them engage with their family, showing them love, letting them remember their why to live, and then getting them out of the bed so they can start mobilization. This woman was initially being treated in the old way, with too much sedation, too much immobilization, and no family. I looked at the nurse, Brooke, and I said, Brooke, we've got to wake her up. We've got to let, you see this man standing outside this glass here? He's got to be at her side. So we woke her up. She desaturated her oxygenation a little bit. Um, and the man got to her bedside, the, the husband. He said, honey, our baby's going to be okay. Our four kids are going to be at the house. We need you. We need you to survive. You need to make it through this. And I love you. And this is why I'm going to stay by your side. He had his PPE on. We had learned that it works. They held hands. She looked him in the eyes. She heard what he said. You could tell something clicked in her brain. And she is alive at home with her babies now. How many people did I, earlier on in the pandemic, allow to die because they had lost their why to live? And what I'm saying is that I, we have learned through touch first and technology second, that we have to go back to what is the basics of humanness and kindness, and that's love and lifting people up and let and let the families in, let them be present, and never go back to those former days of what I call anti-medicine at the early stages of COVID. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question I have, and this, this question came in several times I saw um, in the chat and um, through me. Many of us have felt gaslit and dehumanized when seeking treatment. What advice can you give patients who are vaccine injured who have long COVID symptoms when they seek care? And that would be either emergency care or just, I guess, routine care. Yeah. You know, first of all, I don't deserve to give you advice. Um, you're asking me for advice, so I'm going to give it. Uh, I'll give you my thoughts. But... I'm not walking in your shoes. Um, as a physician, I can tell you that I think, especially to physicians who aren't believers in vaccine injury and or long COVID, I think, uh, and this may sound kind of crazy, I'm making this up as I go because I haven't thought this out in advance. 
but some sort of my wife calls it an Oreo where you where you sandwich something, you know, good, bad, good. Something with it prefaces a statement by saying, I got a vaccine because I believed, obviously, Nicole, you believed in potentially preventive medicine. You took that vaccine because you thought it would help. And stating that up front and then saying, I, I'm the last person that ever thought that I would be injured by this vaccine, but the temporal nature of my signs and symptoms are clearly related to the time I got this vaccine. And if you as a scientist, as a physician, pay attention to other people's diseases about when they occur in relationship to exposures, like exposure to COVID, a few days later you're getting symptoms, now you have a positive test, clearly that was your exposure, then I was exposed to this vaccine. I was perfectly healthy before. Six days later, I started getting a neuropathy. It's, it's true, true, and related, not true, true, and unrelated. And starting out with some sort of using our own weapons against us that we use, we, we put together stories that are time laden and that are temporally related and use that mechanism that we've been taught to use to make them listen. Is that, is that helpful at all? Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's great. Um, yeah, that, that, that is great. Um, and then I have one more question somebody put in and um, basically it's about nutritional deficiencies. If you've seen them in post COVID or um, post vaccine and a lot of people have presented with low iron, particularly low ferritin, including myself, although it's not my question, <laughs> um, low B12, low vitamin D. Um, have you or any other physicians considered to evaluate anti-intrinsic factors or anti-parietal antibodies in long COVID or vaccine patients, which which in my layman terms, lay person's terms, that uh, has to do something with absorption, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. this is great. L l let, me, let me just come straight out and say that, that as soon, the vast, let's just talk Turkey about this, okay? The vast majority of doctors trained in Western medicine think that vitamins are okay to take, but don't cause real disease unless they're profoundly deficient or profoundly elevated, okay? I am, I am fully on board with you, and I disagree with, with what I just said. I don't agree with that anymore. I think that there is a lot of organic disease. Let me say this clearly. I think there's a lot of organic disease, real disease being created in long COVID patients by functional deficits of, of, of micro and macronutrients and by the immune system dysregulating the way that things are metabolized in your bodies. So I fully believe this, but I want you to hear me say that most doctors don't. And the reason is that many, many large randomized controlled trials with standardized medicine have been conducted and been found negative. Uh, so we are, we are trained, conditioned, to think that vitamins are important, like diseases like scurvy and very, very sure, those are real. That's what I'm, that's, that's, that's a given. But when you come in with a slightly low level of this and this and this, most doctors think that that's bunk and they're not going to listen. So my advice is this, you're asking, find a functional mm -hmm. doctor. A functional medicine doctor will listen. They are a new, they've been around for 10, 15, 20 years but most of them have been kind of considered outsiders of traditional medicine. Long COVID is creating a bunch of functional medicine doctors who will test a panel of things and help you get replete, you know, sufficient when you're insufficient. So I think if you go to the average doctor, they're going to think this is hocus and they're going to dis disregard you. I think you have to, you have to go to the right person who will listen, do the right assays. And I even know a pulmonary critical care doctor in the Midwest who's converted her practice into functional medicine. So they're, they're out there. You need to find the right person and, and have them listen to you because I believe it is real. Okay. And that's caused by some sort of autoimmunity. Um, yeah. they, so just in a nutshell, we haven't really discussed this. What we think is happening is that the virus comes in attaches itself and invades different cells, the respir respiratory epithelium, but also the lining of blood vessels. So when the virus hits the endothelial cells, these lining of blood vessels, it causes injury 
to the endothelium. So here's a blood vessel. It's got all these endothelial cells on it. The virus creates a disease of the lining of the blood vessel. When that ha happens, all throughout the body, we get problems with blood flow uh, in, in small capillary beds, and we get problems with absorption of the GI tract. Um, that's not endothelium, but that's the lining of the blood of, of the GI tract. And the, the, the immune system of the body takes care of the acute infection, but the virus stays around as a viral ghost. We found the viral ghost, in, especially in the GI tract, but also in other regions of the body. And in the brain, what we think is going on, and we're studying this, as I said, hopefully with NIH soon, uh, is that the, the neurons in the brain have a set of cells around them called glial cells. Um, astrocytes, microglia, these cells have a lot of functions, but one of the things that these glial cells do is they support the neurons. It doesn't look like that the neurons are directly invaded by COVID, but the glial cells are. And so for weeks and months later, the glial cells become injured. And when they are injured, it's kind of like saying, I'm going to grow flowers with no dirt. The flower is the neuron. The, the neuron, the flower can't grow well unless it has the nutrients and the supportive structure around it, which are the glial cells. So when the glial cells get injured, the neurons die indirectly. And then the person ends up with a dementia-like problem, which is a memory deficit, uh, executive function deficit. And for all the world, looks like a mild cognitive impairment or moderate dementia. And that's what long COVID brain-induced disease is. Um, so those are some thoughts. And that's one of the reasons I think that we need to study not just antivirals, but immunomodulators to try and get the immune system back on peer. Um, and we're going to try and figure out if that works. If it, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then we, we still build on that knowledge. No, no, no harm in trying. Um, I know there's probably a thousand questions in the chat, so I'm going to hand it over to Talia. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, we have a ton of questions. Um, so I apologize ahead of time if we are unable to get to your question, but I will be saving the chat and we will try to address them in any way that we can. So I'm going to start right into this. Um, so we have one question from Melissa. She says, hi, thank you for your willingness to help. Have you seen what's going on as far as lactic, lactic acid overload? There are people with long COVID, V injury, and MECFS testing their lactate with meters that look like glucose meters. Sure. Yeah, I'll try and be brief because I know there's a bunch of questions. So I'll try to make my answer shorter than I've been doing. And I apologize for that. We Another theory, another hypothesis we have, and we're testing this in our study if we, if we get this funding from the NIH, um, and that study is called the reverse long COVID study, by the way, RVLC, reverse long COVID, um, is that we have mitochondrial disease. So the mitochondria um, help you process oxygen and do oxidative phosphorylation. Well, if mitochondria become essentially geriatric in your body, if they have rapid aging, then they cannot process oxygen. And what happens is your body goes into anaerobic metabolism instead of aerobic metabolism. And the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. So it could be that the rise in the lactic acid is because that person's mitochondria are diseased and they then have to use the energy produced by lactic acidosis, by, by the lactic acid cycle. And so there is a good scientific background to buy why that might be happening. Thank you. <laughs> um, our next question we have from uh, Ezra, and he is asking, um, would love to hear from Dr. Ely about the upcoming bars. bars yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, name. so, um, yeah, so. So I told you that we studied baricitinib in acute COVID. It worked. It saved lives. Long COVID is a different situation. It may not, baricitinib and other immunomodulators might not work in long COVID. We don't know. So as a scientist, what we say to ourselves is, what are the leading hypotheses and how can we test them? And the, 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 the highest echelon study is a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So we have worked with Lilly. And Lilly, I mean, kudos to them, by the way, because after... After Barry, baricitinib worked for acute COVID. We, they promised that they would provide baricitinib free of charge to any human being in a lower middle income country who had acute COVID. That means India, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Sub-Saharan Africa. And millions of people have gotten baricitinib for acute COVID free. Lily did that. I don't have any, by the way, this is important. 
I don't have any stock in Lily. I don't make any money from Lily. I never got paid a single penny from Eli Lilly. I refused any financial benefit from the Cove Barrier Study and any ongoing. So I have no financial conflicts of interest with this drug. If it works, doesn't work, it will not change my finances, period. But we thought if it worked in acute, maybe it'll work it long. So we are proposing a double-blind placebo-controlled trial where people will come in with long COVID, they get randomized to either placebo or baricitinib, take that drug for up to six months, and then we will measure the brain function and the POTS disease and the cardiovascular disease um, at the baseline, again at six months, and again at 12 months. That's what we proposed at NIH. We're waiting to hear back. Um, they may not like it and they may reject the proposal, but that's what we're trying to do. If we do it, we're also going to do neuroimaging to see how the brain changes over time. We're going to check all kinds of biomarkers from the serum and the lumbar punctures and really get to the bottom line of what, what is the science here? What did the immunomodulator do? Um, don't think of it as an immunosuppressive drug. Baricitinib, by the way, is already a FDA approved drug for both COVID, but it's also approved for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and um, alopecia areata, which are chronic immune mediated diseases. So what we're trying to do is modulate the immune system, not suppress it, but modulate it and be very careful to make sure that people are monitored for side effects and any adverse events. That's what the reverse LC study is gonna be about with baricitinib. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Soren. He asks, uh, could you describe the pathology of breathing issues that are occurring in people for whom standard imaging has been normal? Any biomarkers present? What sort of PFTs are being seen or any other significant tests? Yeah, let me do this on a basic level too. So what they were asking about was the Xenon studies done out of the UK, which is great. I'll get to that in a second. But the most important thing that happens, first off with COVID, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, inhale the virus gets in your respiratory epithelium, it denudes or it, it, it sloughs, and then the virus goes into your lungs and the what used to be air sacs become filled with fluid and pneumonia. That's acute COVID. That's the kind of doctor I am at the bedside. I care for them in the ICU. When that heals, sometimes it doesn't heal all the way and you're left with lung scarring. Think of it like a keloid scar in the lung. A keloid is like if I cut myself and it heals up with heaping amounts of scar tissue, that keloid, it's, it's too much reaction to heal. The lung can make too much reaction and healing and leave your lung scarred. That is a, a visible on an x-ray, a CT scan. We can melt that away usually with steroids, and we do. So those are the, the most common types of lung disease. But there are people who don't have x-ray abnormalities on their CT or x-ray, and they still feel short of breath. And these xenon studies I won't get into how xenon works, it's an inert gas, but they prove that gas exchange is abnormal in patients who don't even have lung scarring. So there is another type of more molecular disease happening in some people's lungs, which we now have seen, and we don't know how to treat that, but it is present and it is real, and it's kind of a, 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 it's a lung manifestation of long COVID. Thank you so much. We have another question from Lisa. Lisa asks, Dr. Ely, as a knowledgeable long COVID patient ally and physician who knows COVID can cause brain damage, what are you doing to advocate for keeping masks in healthcare after Vanderbilt CIBS Center and hospitals nationwide drop requirements? Yeah, good point. Um, you know, there was a big ruckus recently with one of the long COVID studies uh, not using masks. Uh, most medical centers have stopped masking. I use a mask indoors uh, now. I'm at, I'm at my own house right now, so I have a mask on. This is my study at my house, by the way. Um, I'm on airplanes when I'm in airports. I just went to um, Europe for a medical meeting. Actually, it's called a, it was called a rehumanization meeting. We're trying to rehumanize medicine. And I just went to Europe. I wore a mask from the moment I left my house until I got a hotel room in Spain. And that was a long time to wear a mask, but I just was like, screw this. I'm not getting long COVID if I can avoid it. So I do that in our research center. We had to address this policy. We said with SIBS, what are we going to do? And we made a rule in our research center that we will wear masks in front of patients as our default. So when we come to a long COVID patient, we have a mask on. Um, some patients ask us to take those masks off um, and we 
do that on a one by one basis. But our default at the SIB Center is to wear a mask in front of our patients to show them the respect that uh, that 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 they deserve in that circumstance. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Pam. Um, as an expert in brain science, what are your thoughts about many people with long COVID beginning to show signs of dementia like illness? Is this the start of dementia or something else related to SARS-CoV-2? How worried should we be that this will progress into dementia? I don't want to scare people, but it is true that there are uh, a, a percentage of patients who are progressing to long-term cognitive impairment, which is which looks like early Alzheimer's or early uh, or, or traumatic brain injury level of brain dysfunction. And this is also true for ICU survivors. The, uh, let me explain to you a term, all AD, which is Alzheimer's disease, or ADRD, Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions. So AD or ADRD. And we study at the SIP Center ADRD, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Post ICU illness picks is a is an RD. It's a related dementia. It's not Alzheimer's, but it's a related dementia. And that patient I told you about, Teresa Martin, the one that I wrote about in every deep drawn breath, she had an acquired dementia. She was 28 years old, and that happened under my watch, which is why I had so much guilt and shame about it. Um. That related dementia is no less sad or less injurious or less harrowing to a person than Alzheimer's. In fact, in some circumstances, it's worse because these people are so young and they have their whole life ahead of them. And they also are the, the, the breadwinners in their family, their young mothers, their young fathers, their siblings, their children of, of, of parents who are sad that their kids can't think as well as they used to. Uh, it's a very real problem. We don't know what the treatment is for this yet. I'm telling you, I don't know the answer. I hope that immunomodulation works. I hope Paxlovid works. We're testing both. Um, for some of those people, uh, there may be, with, with post-intensive care syndrome, we actually use um, cognitive rehabilitation. Now, that's different than long COVID because long COVID patients have such bad post-exertional malaise. And the PEM of long COVID patients is both muscle and nerve, neck down and neck up. I hear you tell me, you teach me that reading a book is not possible anymore. Um, and, and, and maybe listening to books is more possible. But that's post-exertional malaise of your brain. So that's why we're trying medical therapies and antivirals and immunomodulators and not pushing the uh, cognitive rehabilitation, which for many people would not work for long COVID or make it worse. Thank you. And Pam says, thank you for answering so honestly. Um, we have time for one more question. So we have, let's see. Um, and then can I read you something after that? Yes. <laughs> uh, so we have a question from Kelly. Some time ago, I read 20% of long COVID patients improve following boosters. Do you know the latest findings on this? And is this observed with Novavax also? No one knows the firm answer to this question. There are absolutely people who have improved with boosters. No <laughs> doubt about it. How that happened, why that happened. If anybody pretends to tell you they know exactly why that happened, I think I've got some swamp property for you. you know, um, we, we don't know. It's, it's very, it's a mystery. And uh, it's science has got to uncover this. But I know personally some people who say their long COVID went away after a booster. And I mean, their stories are very convincing. Just like Nicole's story is temporarily related to her getting the vaccine and getting worse. I know some people who found the opposite. Um, so I, I just can't give you a good scientific answer based on that. And I don't want to give you my opinion. Yeah, I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, How about a short read? Yes. When I was uh, a, a young boy, my dad left, left us and, and uh, my mom was raising us in Louisiana. We had no money. She made $17,000 a year. She was a school teacher, directed Shakespeare. And um, Greg, come say hi to my friends, Greg. Come here. Okay. I'm a caregiver for my brother-in-law, Greg. Greg, say hi. Wave to everybody. Hi. 
Okay. Greg, I'm on the I'm on the call with him now, so I'm gonna come see you in just a minute, okay? Okay. Okay. See you soon. Close that door, okay? Okay. Okay. Greg is my brother-in-law. He's my wife's only sibling. He has Down syndrome. He's 58 years old. Um, he's never had COVID. Can you believe that? Amazing. That we know of. Anyway, when I was young and and my, and my dad left, I started reading Maya Angelou. Thank you all for saying hi to Greg. Um, I'm on Twitter for two reasons: science and love. So I tweet about science and also tweet about love. And some of the things I share on Twitter are the things I'm learning from Greg, which is a, a privilege to learn from him. Um, I read Maya Angelou's book, I Know What the Cage Bird Sings. And I started identifying with her. And not that I understood her suffering by any means. You know, she was a black woman in the deep south. I'm a white guy. So it's totally different. But she, she was a hero for me. And later in my life, I was... Uh, when when Bill Clinton was getting inaugurated, uh, she was working on her poem for his inauguration. She was America's poet laureate, and I got to take care of her. At um, and and I have permission to tell that story, and she's mm -hmm. in, in every deep drawn breath. Um, her story is in, is in the book. But at the end of the book, I I tell the story that I met her son, Guy Johnson, and I want to read to you that interaction because it has to do with with something he taught me that I think is relevant for long COVID. I was excited to speak to Mr. Johnson, Maya's son. When asked what it was like to grow up in the shadow of his mother, he responded, I grew up in her light. Sometimes I wasn't worthy of it, but it has always been an experience that expanded me. I sensed this graciousness, this wise humility when, I, when we spoke. I told him with a schoolboy's enthusiasm about the way his mother's words had reached me and struck a chord. He told me, my mother always said, and this is the only place in the world that this Maya Angelou quote exists in print. So I'm very thankful that it's in every deep drawn breath. My mother always said, I write from a black perspective, but I aim for the human heart. We talked about the challenges that racial tensions bring up for society and individuals and long COVID patients. The way the pandemic had shown that some communities are more vulnerable than others. It made me stop and think about how I could change my work as a doctor for the better. And I shared this with Mr. Guy Johnson. He seemed to understand and told me that I needed to embrace a spirit of cultural empathy. As Mr. Johnson spoke, I was intrigued by his words and I could see how it would be better for my patients if I developed a heightened awareness of their cultures. In addition to getting to know them as individuals, there was so much I wanted to know about him, his life. It made me think, what if I were meeting him as a patient in my ICU? Would I allow him to go through the depersonalization chamber that I'd put so many of my patients through before COVID? So I read that to you to let you know that I'm guilty. I'm convicted and I'm trying to change. And I don't want to be the same doctor that I was before. And I'm listening to you and I'm learning. And I hope that we can build a community around you, with you, beside you so that we can get you answers and help you have less suffering as you're going forward. And I, I truly appreciate being present with you today and, and thank you for letting me um, let me be, be on this walk with you. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. Um, and Frank, I think you had some questions you wanted to ask Dr. Ely. I just had um, one more question, Wes, and I'm glad we got to meet Greg. I, I asked your permission to ask a question about Greg, and you told me that was fine. So getting to meet him is is a bonus for all of us who follow um, you on Twitter. And you often talk about um, learning lessons from Greg. You've obviously reached the pinnacle in the medical field, but I think that's interesting um, when you talk about how much he teaches you. So my question is, can you give us just a couple of examples of things he's taught you and how you apply those to your everyday life as well as your practice? Oh, thank you so much. And this was not a planted question. I didn't know you were going to ask it. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll tell you a couple of things. And, you know, when I first met Greg, I've been married to my wife for 33 years. And so I'm, I've known Greg a long time and I've watched him go through things he had sleep apnea years ago. He used to be very overweight. He's lost that weight now. He now has Alzheimer's disease. And, it, it, you know, it, it's a lot for his suffering. But I completely underestimated 
how he has to work through his own problems in life, just like we all do. And he seems so happy so much of the time and so carefree. He pay, he, it's a beautiful example that he pays attention to the simplest things in life. Life is not complicated for Greg. He, he pays attention to the things like looking you in the eyes. Uh, he has a thing called a nose nose and he touches me. He says, nose nose. And he, he touches me on my nose and he says, I love you, Wes. And I missed you. And he doesn't get distracted by image and by worrying about other people's opinions of him. So he keeps that stuff on the forefront of his mind, which is the simplest and most beautiful things in life. And yet, what Kim and I have been noticing lately as he's been progressing in his Alzheimer's disease is that we can see that he's embarrassed about making a mess in the bathroom and me having to clean up after him in the bathroom or embarrassed when he lashes out and doesn't treat somebody right, but he doesn't even know why he's doing that. He, he's confused about why, why that's happening for him. So what we realize is that we have to be patient with him and the stuff that he's working through, because just because he's down syndrome doesn't mean he's not aware of how confusing life can get at times. And I guess it's a combination, Frank, of me learning that there's beauty and simplicity and then when Greg goes to sleep at night, he usually falls asleep way faster than I do because he's not worried. But on the other hand, all of us are human beings and we all are priceless and no amount of disease makes us any less valuable than we were before. And we all carry with us burdens, even Greg, um, that we need to pay close attention to with one another, be kinder, love each other more, and, uh, and and simply be present. Wes, uh, as we close, um, thank you for that and your heart and your compassion and what you're doing for um, this community. It is very, as I said, refreshing. Many people on this call have not heard a doctor speak like you have today. Um, we thank you for your time. By having Nicole, we'll give it back to tell you to close. And thank you, Wes. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ely. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, everyone who is in attendance tonight. This was an incredible event. I have chills. <laughs> um, I argue this every time, but it never gets old. I'm just so amazed and grateful and overwhelmed by all of you and your support of one another and your respect for one another. Um, and I, I hope you found this event as wonderful as all the comments in the chat. So I guess you did, <laughs> it's just really going off and everyone is so grateful to have met Greg tonight. Um, so that was an addition, an additional wonderful thing that I don't think anyone was expecting. Um, so thank you all so much. And yeah, that's really all. Thanks everybody. Appreciate thank you. you. Have a great night. Let me know how can be of service going forward. Bye-bye.